am here with Ebony Brown, who I will uh, let introduce herself. Thanks, Stephen. I'm a partner at Rethink Education. We're a venture capital fund that invests in education technology across the life cycle. So early childhood, K-12, higher ed, and workforce. We have over 80 portfolio companies and we invest um, like one to five million dollar check sizes and seed in series A and series B companies, which we can get into a little bit in this conversation. Yeah, let's un let's unpack that a little bit. And and Ebony, I know that you have about 10 minutes before you have to go. There were some technical challenges with the prior session. So um, so uh, so that with that caveat for everybody who is uh, watching, um, why don't you just for people start with the basics, you, you know, you're a venture capitalist. Where do you fit in the spectrum of funding? So if you're thinking of building a company or you've built a company and you're looking for capital, you know, there's a sequence of, of funding that is sort of the normal course of events. Um, why don't you uh, just for everybody outline what that, uh, that sequence looks like and, and where do you fit in? Sure. I would say most companies fall within the lifestyle business category, um, which can generate a lot of revenue, maybe like could be a million dollars a year or up to 10 million. Of course, much smaller um, tail of how low that can go a year. But most companies don't need venture capital funding. Venture capital is for um, less than 10 percent of companies that are created. Um, it's for um, companies that want to grow and scale very fast um, within like a five to 10 year frame and then sell their company. Um, and you can sell your company to a larger company um, or your company goes public. You sell it to the public market. Um, and so venture capitalists, we pull um, fund commitments, like large commitments from outside investors um, that are interested in a, a, a certain investment thesis. For me, all of our um, investors are interested in ed tech and the future of that. They entrust our team to find um, SaaS-based ed tech technologies um, and invest in them in early stages. So we give them capital to help them to be able to grow really fast before they sell. And in exchange for that capital, um, we own a percentage um, of their company. So it's called um, dilutive. There's also, we can talk about different kinds of funding, non-dilutive capital, which can come in the forms of grants from foundations or sometimes from pitch competitions or accelerators. Sometimes it's non-dilutive. We can talk about that as well. Yeah, that's great. I mean, the, the um... The way that I usually think about it, I don't know if you would agree or not, is that companies that are uh, sort of a good fit for venture capital are really trying to change the world. You know, they, they start out small, but their goal is to get enormous. And so they're using other people's money to be able to invest in growth much faster than they are able to generate revenue or generate profits. And so they operate at a loss using somebody else's capital so they can get really big much more quickly. Uh, and the investors are looking at that business as an opportunity to generate um, what they hope is a significant return on their uh, investment. Um, is that kind yeah. of how you think about things? Yeah, and I guess in contrast to that, like something that wouldn't qualify for venture would be like if you were creating something in your city like for just your city or just for your neighborhood or just for a smaller um, demographic versus something that can kind of scale globally yeah. quickly. Yeah, and you'd mentioned a lifestyle business, which generally, you know, almost never is a, is a candidate for venture capital, but there are other sources. So if somebody were interested in building a business um, that, would allow them to live the kind of lifestyle that they want to live. And they're not necessarily trying to create another Google or another, you know, large, gigantic 
company, fill in the blank of your choice, Unity, for example. Um, they, uh, they, there are other ways to get capital to, to finance some of that early um, growth. Could you um, maybe talk a little bit about that? Um, I honestly know less about like how lifestyle businesses get funding. I would say the most sustainable way is like as you get profits to pour those back into the building of your company. I mean, I guess there are also cases where people can take out loans um, from the bank. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly by far the best way to, to grow if you can is to generate profits and then use your profits to fund your growth because then you won't uh, necessarily be indebted to others and you will own the entirety uh, of your company. Um, and uh, uh, bank loans are certainly uh, common in the healthcare space. Uh, we see a lot of companies able to get grants from the National Institutes of Health or other sources to fund some of the early uh, work that it's really hard to find somebody to pay for it. Uh, we also find, and I've, I've seen this both with lifestyle businesses and also with VC back companies where uh, in the very early days, people are able to raise small amounts of, of capital, even from their friends or their family um, who will invest, you know, a few thousand here, a few thousand they're really more because they love the person than because they're thinking of this as the smartest investment opportunity that they've uh, ever uh, ever seen. Um, do you? Um, so I know that that uh, we just have a few more minutes um, of your time. Um, I, do you for for underrepresented uh, founders? Do you um, you know invest in in those companies? Do you have any? kind of um, allocation of funds specifically for companies that are started by underrepresented uh, founders who historically have not um, in, enjoyed the same kind of access to venture capital that, uh, that other founders have. Sure. And as you stated, like people get initial capital from family and friends. Um, there's a number of, under, of underrepresented founders that don't have access um, to those initial stages of capital because their family doesn't necessarily have the generational wealth um, to support um, just loaning or giving them um, $10,000 or $50,000, $100,000, whatever be the case. Um, Rethink was started in 2012. About 12% of our portfolio um, is, is from underrepresented founders. Um, Initially, that wasn't necessarily due to a mandate, but investing in education technology, um, especially if you're trying to reach the majority of the population, it's no surprise that um, a number of our founders are underrepresented because a lot of the largest challenges in um, education affect um, underrepresented populations. Um, over the last year, we do have a pool of capital, $5 million, um, specifically for underrepresented founders at the earliest stages that might need money from the friends and family round stage. Um, and that's so that we can make sure that we're not um, missing out on opportunities to um, kind of pour into these founders that have experience these challenges, have great ideas, but might not have the startup capital um, to get off the ground. Got it. Um, and you also mentioned uh, earlier, I think you dropped in some terms like series A or things like that. Can you just quickly, uh, for people outline, you know, what are the stages of venture capital and what do those terms mean? Sure, so usually, Founders that are raising venture capital raise multiple rounds. And so each round just has a different name. Like the first round, the first round now is pre-seed and that's for founders that just have a big idea, aren't necessarily generating revenue yet, um, but have a, you know, a, 
very unvalidated um, traction, um, but maybe they have experience or they've really outlined the problem and understand how they want to try to tackle that. That's the pre-state round and it's earliest. Then their seed stage. Um, and that is usually when founders start to have some kind of product market fit. And it kind of just goes up from there. Seed, series A, series B, C, D, E, F, or however high until a company IPOs. Or, and founders don't necessarily have to raise through F or G or whatever um, before they exit. These are just how you keep track of where a company is in, in the funding life cycle. Got it. All right, well, Ebony, I know that you have to uh, jump off to another meeting. So thank you so much for, uh, for your thoughts and, and your perspective. Um, I'm happy to, uh, I'll stay on for another uh, 10 minutes here to um, uh, chat a little bit about the difference between incubators and accelerators and, and field any questions that uh, people have. But um, Ebony, thanks so much. I hope you have a, a great rest awesome. of your day. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Bye. All right, so um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead and drop them into uh, wherever you drop questions. And uh, I will um, maybe chat a little bit about, uh, or talk a little bit about the difference between incubators and accelerators and what role they play in the development of companies. So uh, generally, as you're building a company, uh, there are lots of options to join accelerators and incubators, which are both designed to help startup companies grow at a faster rate than they might otherwise be able to uh, do on their own and to hopefully achieve a greater uh, odds of success than they would be on their own. So both accelerators and, and incubators tend to have uh, curriculum. So there will be classes of, of some types. There will be uh, mentoring. So people who've built companies before who are subject matter experts who are available to provide guidance and coaching for the companies. Um, the difference tends to be that accelerators are usually time bound. So you uh, come in as a cohort. So there might be six, eight, 10 companies who all start on the same day. They're often around three months long. And so at the end of the three months, you graduate from the accelerator. Uh, and these uh, models are usually providing some amount of, of money to help fund the company in exchange for taking a percentage, usually between four and 7% of the company uh, that they take as, a, as uh, in exchange for their services. Um, incubators are usually not time bound. They tend to be, uh, they're less driven by cohorts. So you can usually join those at any point along the way. Uh, the services may or may not be uh, uh, comparable, and you often do need to uh, provide uh, equity as well in exchange for the services. Um, Matter is an incubator. Uh, you can apply whenever you want. Uh, we're an application-based um, model. We're a little unusual. We're organized as a not-for-profit uh, entity. We do not take equity in companies. Um, we, uh, we don't provide capital ourselves, but we have relationships with lots of VCs, lots of angel investors, uh, and lots of other sources of uh, capital. capital. Um, a couple questions that have uh, popped up. So uh, one is, um, do you need to be generating revenue before you uh, seek venture capital dollars or uh, apply to an incubator or an accelerator? Uh, absolutely not. Um, the overwhelming majority of companies who get venture capital funding are not profitable. Uh, and in fact, usually the way that it works is venture capital is being provided so that you can spend money, you can invest in your growth bef ahead of your profits, uh, even ahead of your revenue. Um, many, if not most companies that are funded by venture capital uh, when they their first rounds of funding, they're not even necessarily generating any revenue, let alone uh, generating profits. Same situation for accelerators and incubators. You absolutely do not need to be uh, profitable. Say for us, we 
like companies that are generating a little bit of revenue or at least have a customer or two, uh, but it is absolutely not a requirement. We have lots of, cost lots of our member companies that aren't generating any revenue uh, and certainly that aren't, uh, that aren't profitable. Um, and then we will help companies attract capital. We will help them get ready to attract capital, figure out their fundraising strategy, uh, and, uh, and then connect them with investors. Um, so one of the things we didn't uh, really talk about with, with Ebony necessarily, um, so she mentioned pre-seed um, money, which is the term for kind of usually the first institutional round. So a venture capital firm might have a pre-seed fund. Uh, there might be pre-seed funding available uh, from different sources. Um, after that, you get sort of the formal rounds of seed funding, of uh, Series A, Series B, et cetera. Um, there is another path uh, of angel investors. Um, angels are, you know, it's a term of art, uh, really, but they tend to invest at the pre-seed and seed stages, usually. They are people with enough uh, wealth or disposable income that themselves that they are uh, interested and excited to provide money to very usually very early stage uh, companies. So uh, angels tend to invest anywhere from five thousand dollars of their own money all the way up to super angels who can invest half a million, a million dollars. You know, tend to be very wealthy uh, individuals, um, but it's very common for angel investors to invest between $25,000 and $100,000 of their own money in particular companies. Um, angel investors will look for, uh, uh, usually it's, it's ideas that they're really excited about. It's entrepreneurs themselves who they can really be passionate about. Um, usually companies at that stage don't have lots of customers. They don't, they don't have a lot of revenue. They don't, you know they don't they don't have a lot of um, of spreadsheets to analyze in terms of here's how the company's been doing because they're so early uh, in the process. So um, the way I usually think about it, friends, people's friends, their family, their uh, distant relatives might invest because they love the person. Uh, angel investors will tend to invest uh, with a huge dose of optimism and hope. And then as you get into institutional venture capitalists, they're going to be doing a lot of diligence on the companies and talking to customers or potential customers, and it becomes a more scientific approach. And then really later stage companies that are raising what's usually referred to as private equity or growth equity, um, those investors are investing based on uh, some pretty sophisticated analytics of historical financials and, comp and uh, comparisons to, uh, to the market. Um, the question about um, the uh, the process of incubating within universities and whether that's similar to nonprofit uh, incubators, it can be. So universities have uh, a lot of universities have set up their own internal incubators for um, for students or faculty who are developing ideas and, and developing uh, developing companies. Y usually. Uh, those those um, models don't take equity. However, depending on how the technology was developed and what the technology is, the university may own some of it. They may help you patent it. It, it, it depends on what it is, what kind of a business. And that applies even to some software companies, depending on who developed the technology in what context, with whose dollars, um, et cetera. That is usually less relevant for like undergraduate um, or master's level students, it's more usually more relevant for doctoral students, postdocs, and faculty. Um, so like some of our, you know, we're located in Chicago, uh, the University of Chicago uh, has a, a, a nice incubator, the uh, Northwestern University has a nice uh, incubator, and these uh, places do provide uh, connections, they provide uh, support, mentoring, uh, guidance, um, they're generally uh, less 
uh, less, um, I guess, ex extensive or expansive than uh, incubators that do nothing but that, the ones that are inside of universities, but they can be really terrific resources for, uh, for students. Um, I think that we have uh, reached the end of the line um, here. So thank you uh, very much for uh, both bearing with us for the technical challenges at the very beginning of uh, this and for, at the prior session. Thanks so much to Unity for uh, inviting me, for including me, uh, including Ebony uh, on her behalf as well, and for focusing on what I personally think is one of the most interesting uh, areas of opportunity, which is uh, digital health and, and software that can improve health and the business of healthcare. Um, if you're interested uh, in more about Matter, you can find us on the web. It's matter.health. Uh, again, I am Stephen Collins, and I hope you all have a terrific rest of your day. Thanks so much.